Hey guys, Graham and Chris back here with you again. Another week of spring training down. The final countdown is on to the 2017 regular season. WBC had started four different places around the world until they begin to converge on California. A lot of stuff to get to. We will get to the craziness that was the USA and the Dominican Republic here in just a little bit. But really before uh, we, we get started, uh, and normally we always put the ball in play and get things harder for you, but before we do, we want to go ahead and, and first send out our, uh, our heartfelt, uh, our prayers and our thoughts towards the Colorado Rockies and their pitcher, Chad Bettis. Uh, within the last several months, it, he had uh, put out on his social media that he had been declared cancer-free, was in remission from testicular cancer. It has come back out that during a routine health checkup last week, Quote, my oncologist believed that he had seen inflamed lymph nodes and ordered an immediate biopsy. I learned this week that my testicular cancer had, has unexpectedly spread, and I will begin a regimen of chemotherapy in the very near future. Although my blood tumor markers remain at normal levels, it's clear that I need to be aggressive in my fight against this illness. Without being proactive, we wouldn't have caught this. I am committed to beating this cancer. My family and I are grateful for the support of the Major League Baseball Players Association, the Rockies organization, and you, the fans, end quote. As someone whose father was diagnosed and passed away from cancer, uh, and I'm sure everyone we know has been touched in some way by this horrific disease, um, our thoughts from the show go out to Chad Bettis and his family, and we hope for a speedy recovery to see you back on the hill uh, in the very, very near future. So Godspeed to Chad Bettis. Absolutely. I think everybody's had a family member or friend or someone in their life that's been touched by this horrible disease. And uh, all I can really say is that, that our thoughts are, are with Chad and, and of course with the Colorado Rockies and his family, you know, which his team becomes part of as a ball player. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's certainly, um, it's never the news you want to hear. Uh, thankfully, they, they found it early, and hopefully before it spreads. Obviously, hearing lymph nodes and cancer is a very, um, a very sobering pairing of, of words that, that you don't ever want to hear. But, again, we hope for a, a very swift recovery. So uh, Godspeed to you. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you are uh, someone who prays or just keeps them in your thoughts, and uh, just do that and, and a, a swift recovery to him. So, as we kind of change gears here and uh, we really get ready to put the ball in play on the show, uh, some news coming out, and this is kind of uh, ironic. It's a record-setting pre-arbitration salary for Chris Bryant, the guy who was a rookie of the year in 2015, was the National League MVP in 2016, a World Series champion, in 2016, and he's going to make a whopping $1.05 million. Well, for a guy in his second year of baseball, it actually is a whopping number. Uh, like you said, this is a record-setting arbitration. Um, when you talk about other guys on his team, Javi Baez, guys like that who are making less than a million dollars this year, despite... Uh, MVP quality play, and he was the MVP last year, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee you a huge contract. And when Chris Bryant was brought up, there was sort of some anger. It, it, it was it was a controversy, but it's the Cubbies were really just using the merits of the rules to their advantage. Which I mean, any any team anybody would do, but certainly. If you're in the Chris Bryant camp, it comes off as a pretty big slap in the face. Right, especially since it's going to keep him in this uh, sort of rookie pay scale for a further year. Exactly. So, like I said, one of the things is that you have to tell yourself, um, especially when you're a guy who follows up a rookie of the year season with an MVP season, you got to tell yourself, I'm one of the top players in this game. I just got to grit my teeth, pay my dues, do my time. I will get a payday one day and play ball the way you play ball. You're going to get paid. So uh, 1.05 million is, 
is a record for arbitration for a guy in his second going into his third year of baseball. So uh, I think you should be excited. I think setting records early is good, um, especially as far as pay goes, pay scale goes. That should uh, enlighten him into what his pay scale might look like in the future. Exactly. And for those of you who, who don't recall, uh, and to me, and, and before I, I kind of explain what Chris and I were referring to, to me this is big that they are already reaching a deal prior to arbitration. Obviously, that's always the goal is to avoid arbitration. As a, as a club, as a player, you want to come together and find common ground. But what had happened was in, uh, in 2015, the, the Cubbies, there was no doubt that Chris Bryant was going to make the club. I mean, I mean he was absolutely uh, on fire in AAA. He had lit up in spring training, yet they didn't call him up. They sent him back down to AAA for 15 games. And that was really, or 15 days. And that was, and everyone knew that's all it's going to be. It's going to be, all right, you're going to be down. Here's a placeholder until we call you up. And the entire point was, as long as he was in the minor leagues, for that small period of time to begin the season, what that did for the Cubs is it, is it gave them an, ex, an additional year of control on him through his rookie contracts. They're going to get him basically for an additional year at the rookie, wa- rookie wage scale. Now, granted, you know, uh, there's no salary cap, but with what we're seeing happen with the new CBA and what the luxury tax is going to be, that's a big thing, and he was very upset, as you'd be expected if you were the guy who was doing the work to make that money, and he said you know, he was going to hold it against the Cubs when it came time for that contract year. So it's a good thing that they're getting it done. It doesn't surprise me with the way that, uh, that, that you, know, you see the Theo Epstein do things, but let's take a look at the guys on that club also who are going to be getting a pretty hefty uh, arbitration summit because there's a lot of young guys. I mean, you and I said this. They're they're kind of the they're this year's Royals. They're the they're Major League Baseball's Seattle Seahawks. Kyle Hendricks is going to get about seven hundred and sixty thousand. Addison Russell six hundred and forty four thousand. Javier Baez six hundred and nine thousand. Kyle Schwarber five hundred and sixty five thousand. Four, I mean, four names who, when you hear that, you think, okay, Cubs, World Series, All-Stars, no question. And they're all making a, less than a cumulative $3 million. And, and let's not forget that last year, in his MVP year, Chris Bryan also only made about $652,000. So he's nearly doubling his salary from last year to this year, which is, which is an impressive jump. You and I have talked offline uh, several times about – the ridiculousness of uh, Major League Baseball contracts, the um, ridiculous amount of money that Major League Baseball players make, that all professional athletes make. Um, $650,000 is well above, well into the top 1% of earners in the United States. And um, in my opinion, that's, that's enough money. But when you're in a game where guys are making $25 million a year and you're the top player in your league you want to be the guy making 25 million dollars a year so i understand that um he's just uh sort of a product of his age um but he didn't make much money last year and if he can produce and he can continue to produce the way he has he's going to eventually he's going to work his way into that that small group of guys the mike trouts of the world who are making 20 25 million a year and even guys like Noah Syndergaard are making you know roughly the same and and we saw that. I mean, you know, Mike Trout had a uh, million-dollar arbitration or, or a pre-arbitration agreement in 2014. Um, Mookie Betts was renewed at 950 k And then, obviously, you know, at that point, once they hit their, their, their full service, I mean, it's going to skyrocket through the roof. So, you know, arbitration is there for a reason. It's the reason that only athletes get to enjoy it. And you and I don't, but... You know, good for him. He's going to see a ton more money coming to him in the near future, and he has obviously a, a ceiling ahead of him that's going to make him um, one of the best players uh, of his generation of ball ballplayers, uh, barring any injury or anything horrendous. Chris Bryant is going to be in the record books and, and on a lot of statisticians and, and historians' minds for many, many years to come. Now, as we transition over 
from the National League Central to the NL East. The Nationals have made some noise, and that's not with Bryce Harper, uh, who we will get into a little bit here and uh, a little bit on the show as we talk with Phil Nevin, uh, former San Francisco Giants third baseman, uh, about kind of his sense of entitlement in the game today, stemming from some comments that Jake Arrieta made. But a guy that we have talked about how many times this offseason, Chris, in Matt Wieters, and uh, the National signed him, and within what, a couple of weeks, yeah, it, pretty much. And uh, the National signed him, and what does that mean? That means that Derek Norris now, once again, has no job. Nationals have placed him on waivers. Well, uh, unlike, he unlikely has, he's going to get claimed. Right, he still has a job. They haven't released him. They just put him on waivers. He's, he's DFA'd. But, um, I yeah, think you and I he's both probably know not, what that's going to mean. Yeah, he's I mean, probably for, he's probably not going to get claimed. Um, but you're talking about a guy who hit 186 last year. I mean, yeah, he's had a hot start. He's what six for 15 in his first uh, six games. Got a couple of dingers. But when you got a guy like Weeters, who's probably going to be your everyday guy behind the dish then it makes sense to dump off a guy who just couldn't get the bat on the ball last season. Um, and he's slated to make four and a half million, almost four and a half million dollars next year. And if they do release him, they have to do it by Tuesday. If they do it by Tuesday, then they only have to pay 30 days of salary, which is only about a sixth of his of his uh, 2017 salary. So, so those of you who are bad at math like me, that's about $700,000. Because if you're thinking of a sixth, then you're, yeah, I'm, I, that doesn't work for me either. So, <laughs> But you're right, man. It does make sense. I mean, you know, a, a guy who, and even Matt Wieters is the same way. They're both, both of their off seasons and, and their current situations now are a product of the struggles that they had last year. And Matt Wieters was clearly not the same uh, catcher he was last year. His power numbers had gone down. He's not the best defensively behind the dish. And Derek Norris, well, I mean, we won't even just say the word power doesn't come to mind when you think a sub-200 batting average. Now, granted, yes, you are playing for a team in the San Diego Padres who was not the best, but you still have to be better than that. And, and, and he had had a very solid first couple of years had actually started in the Nationals organization uh, and then was dealt for Gio Gonzalez back in 2011. And then they obviously they reacquired him this year. So I don't think that none of us were surprised because the Nationals are paying $20 million guaranteed to Matt Wieters. You don't have a spot for four different guys. Then they also signed up was it Wellington Castillo, I believe that, uh, or was that the, the Orioles? Let me look up and see at the moment, who the Nationals catchers are. Because I, I know that we uh, discussed the fact that, I mean, th- there were four catchers uh, sitting on that Nationals roster. It was uh, Matt Leder, oh, Norris, Jose Lobotone, Jose Lobotone, and Lobotone. Pedro Severino. That's, that's right, yeah. Castillo was, was, went to the Orioles to replace Leaders. I mean, there's no room for four catchers. There's just not. When, when you've got probably enough room on your bench for four utility guys, and the rest are going to be in your pen – he it just it unfortunately didn't work out for Derek Norris. I'm sure he will find something somewhere, but you know, I mean, he's probably not going to get the four million that he got in in Washington, and he's going to come in having to play catch up for a club. And I I don't know really who's looking for a catcher. Thankfully, which we'll get to in a minute, the Royals aren't having to look for a catcher, but that could have happened with WBC, and we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes here. But it's going to be a, a, a bit of a road for him to figure out, you know, where he needs to go. Um, you know, you got guys like Cervelli in Pittsburgh. You've got um, Russell Martin in Toronto. Some older guys wouldn't be the worst spot in the world for him to end up there, backing those guys up with, especially in Toronto, with with, with a team that is, I think, slated to go ahead and give the Red Sox a a run this year. Obviously, the Red Sox are going to be expected to win, but it's baseball. 162 games, anything can happen. If, if he would be willing to take the pay cut and they have a spot for him there, 
it wouldn't be bad to see him there uh, at all. Or even do the Tampa Bay Rays, who made a run at Matt Wieters, make a run at Derek Norris? Well, I think Derek Norris is going to find, just like Matt Wieters found, that there's no real market right now for a sort of average to below average defensive catcher. Um, not that Matt Wieters is a below average defensive catcher or Derek Norris is a below average defensive catcher, but their performance over the last season was well below, well below average. And there's just not a market for guys like that right now. So yeah, Tampa Bay could make a run at him. You could see him go find a slot behind another catcher who's aging. But the fact of the matter is that Derek Norris is no spring chicken either and kneeling behind the plate, it really puts a, a lot of wear and tear on the knees. And catchers' lives, just their life expectancy in, in Major League Baseball just isn't as long as, as some other players. It, it, exactly. And the players who are good, are, you're going to see get moved around. Craig Biggio began as a catcher. Everyone thinks of him as a second baseman, you know, a guy in the outfield, mainly in second for Houston, started off playing behind the plate. Buster Posey has began to do work at first base. Joe Maurer is now 100% a first baseman. So we're seeing that. He made nine errors uh, last year behind the dish for San Diego. Um, you know, it has a fielding, an overall fielding percentage of 992, which isn't bad. But then you look at how many, uh, you know, he's, he, caught, uh, he caught 20 Runners out of 76, a 21 percent caught stealing. His average, uh, or his his overall percentage is 26 percentage or 26 percent career. He's caught 100 runners out of 289. So he is not a he's a guy kind of like Mike Piazza who you, who you're willing to run on, but unlike Piazza, he doesn't have the bat that Piazza had, you know, to kind of supplement that that subpar defense behind the plate grand scheme. So, uh, like you said, and I think, I think that really kind of said it all, is that, unfortunately, he is a subpar defensive catcher who is struggling with, struggling with the stick, and a team isn't going to want to spend you know, $4 million, $5 million on him right away. You're going you're gonna to have to see a team that has a need, I think, in order to go out and, and, and pull him in. So it's starting to get to be that time of season again, that time of the year again, when the unfortunately the injury reports start to roll in. And I really hate for this show to turn into the injury report, but it seems like some big names have gone down here in the last couple of days or been shut down here in the last couple of days. And one that I'm a little bit surprised about, especially since he took so much time off last season, due to injury, I really thought that he would do everything in his power to come back healthy and ready to play, is Sonny Gray, who's now going to be shut down for three weeks, meaning he's going to miss opening day and could possibly miss April, if he's not careful, uh, having to get back into his, into his throwing program. Um, and he's got a lat strain that looks like it's going to put him out for a while, which is really bad because this is obviously – the number one pitcher in a rotation that's not great anyway. And, exactly. Yes, very and true. To lose that means that's just one more L you guys are going to take every five games. Um, and and to your that point, he, it's looking like Susan Slusser from the San Francisco Chronicle is saying he may not pitch until late April. So it could right. even be another six weeks, seven weeks before we see him back on the hill, or at least even rehabbing to come back on the hill in the bigs. Right, because think about it. He's, not only does he have to get shut down completely, but then he loses all of that first two weeks that he did in spring training of getting into a throwing program. He's got to start that all over again. So that's in, on top of the three weeks. Once he gets back into that throwing program, then he's got to make a rehab start. Once he makes that rehab start, which is probably going to be some crappy game or maybe even a triple-A start in Fresno, who knows where he's going to make that rehab start. But – once he makes the rehab starts, then he can come back and pitch Major League Baseball. But with a, with a, especially with a, with a latch strain, you're not going to take any chances with that guy hurting himself permanently. Um, and he hasn't had a great spring training. Uh, his, his last start, he got dumped on. He went 
uh, two innings and gave up seven earned runs to the Arizona Diamondbacks, who jumped in for five runs in the first inning, including a three-run homer by Kettle Marte. And that's in stark contrast to his previous start. When he went two scoreless innings, yes, he gave up that, that leadoff double to Travis Jankowski, but he then fanned four of the next six batters and got six consecutive outs following that. So it, he seems to be unstable. He seems to be inconsistent. And whether it's that injury or whether it's just that something that's happening to him, he's obviously fallen off since a couple of years ago when he was really lighting up uh, the American League. Finished third in the Cy Young in 2015, was an all-star that year. Uh, I mean, undeniably the best. He, was, he went 14-7, uh, 208 innings pitched, 166 hits. But, uh, I mean, he struck out 169 and walked 59, which is a nice – I mean, I mean, that's really, you know, it's what you want to see. 2.86 strikeouts per walk, uh, less than one homer per nine. And then last year, with all the injuries, he doubled that a homer and a half per nine innings, a 5-11 and 11 record, strikes out 94, walks 42, so just over 2Ks her walk, everything has gone down. And, and the problem here, and, and you, you said this and kind of alluded to it, is that th- this team, this rotation, it's struggling. It, it's, it's tanking. I mean, you know, and I don't mean that in a way of they are making this a tank year, but th- they, just, they have never had that break. A couple of years ago, we saw them in the wild card game, thought they had a chance, and then it just they plummeted again. It, it, they can't seem to gain consistent traction and Sonny Gray would have been a great trade piece, and there was, a, a, I think, a large expectation of him to be a trade piece. But now, your second injury in less than a year, uh, you know, it, it seems to be upper body injuries, which is, I mean, we know there's a lot of moving pieces in the upper body, the shoulder to the elbow, obviously the forearm. Your back muscles are going to take a lot of strain because of all the force that you're using in, in, a, in a movement that the body is not made to generally do on a repetitive, uh, you know, uh, over time and time again, it, it really hurts the A's long term because the possibility of them being able to move Gray now or at least move him for P- a piece or pieces that would have been helpful, his trade value is just, I mean, it's just blowing out the window. You can hear the cash blowing down the freeway. So the other, but the only way this is going to end up being positive for somebody is guys like Colby Lewis and Doug Fister who are still on the free agent market, who now probably are looking at a job because Billy Bean's got to have something to go ahead and plug into that hole. And there's no way now, after coming from last year, having an offseason to continue the rehab and getting hurt again, that you can believe Sonny Gray can go through an entire season without going on the DL. He's probably going to miss more time throughout the year. He's just he's one of those guys that you can't you can no longer trust as a GM or as a manager, Bob Melvin, that you can pencil this guy in every five days and get out of him what you need. It's unfortunate, but it's baseball. It's the way things go. Right, and the, the, the thing is, is that we're talking about a guy who's Billy Bean's dream, right, uh, in 2015. He's an effective pitcher. He wins 14 games. Like you said, he goes 2-7-3 ERA, over 208 innings pitched. And then last year, he only plays nine fewer, starts nine fewer games, but he pitches almost a hundred fewer innings, which just tells you how quickly he was getting bounced out of games. And in 2015, and his numbers I say were identical or worse. Right. Well, what I'm saying is a dream player in 2015 is we're talking about a guy who only made $512,000 in 2015. That's Billy Bean's dream. Effective pitcher making less than half, making about a half a million dollars. Last year, he made 527000 Billy Bean's going to be looking for another guy who he can pay half a million dollars to who's going to be as effective or reasonably effective in that starting line. I doubt he's going to find it. I mean, it's going to be someone in, the, it's going to be someone in their organization. He's not going to be able to move Sonny Gray from one team to the next. Um, you know, it, it, you're going to need to see out of him a, some semblance of continuous health probably through this entire season, maybe they can move him um, 
at the deadline. If they move him at the deadline this year, it's going to be for very little. So you can move him in the off season to a team that is looking for something, you know, kind of in the hopes of catching lightning in a bottle. Then maybe you get something out of him. You get something in return that's decent and can help you being carried, uh, obviously, you know, you know, down down the road. Now, we talked about the World Baseball Classic. The, the heartbreaker in Miami that was the USA and the Dominican Republic. But south of the border in Mexico, it could have been a lot worse. And Salvador Perez gets run into, of, of all people, by the Royals' backup catcher <laughs> and uh, leaves with a knee injury, which, uh, you know, we made fun of it last, last week. You know, what was that sound? And it was the uh, it was the sound of, of of all the Red Sox fans exhaling a sigh of relief. David Price was still healthy. You can imagine that same thing came out of Kansas City. Uh, I mean, a, a guy who is really the leader of of that staff, the leader of that ball club on the field, the general the catcher in Salvador Perez. Thankfully, as every you know, he, he went uh, underwent an MRI. Everything came out okay. The x-rays came back negative. It's just inflammation. He will be out of the WBC for the rest of, uh, for the, rest of, of, of the uh, I don't want to say the season, but basically you know, for the rest of the tournament. Uh, but he should be able to come back healthy for opening day uh, of 2017 for Kansas City. Yeah, and you can only imagine, like you said, how relieved Royals fans are based on the fact that it was true Buter that, you know, ran into him. And none of them want to see Drew Buter starting on opening day. Now, that's not saying that that might not happen. It depends on how bad this knee injury is going to be. Now, there's no structural damage, damage to the knee as far as the MRI says, but sitting out the rest of the WVC might not be good enough. He might still have some, some tenderness and some soreness. And knee injuries are really bad, like we said, for catchers who already have a short expectancy in Major League Baseball because of the strain that, they, that their position puts on their knees. So if he's still having issues getting up from behind home plate, getting the ball to second base, getting the ball to third base on, on stealing attempts, then you might actually see Drew starting uh, on opening day, which – I'm not going to say that the guy. Whoa, knew. whoa, whoa, whoa! Are, are, wait, whoa, whoa! Are we going conspiracy? Are we getting a a a, a non journalistic conspiracy theory from you, Chris? I'm not going to say that the guy knew that he might take Salvador Perez out and that might improve his standing in the Royals organization, because that's ridiculous. Obviously, Drew Buter is not going to go out there and intentionally try to hurt his teammate. What he did go out there and do was intentionally try to play baseball the way baseball is meant to be played as hard and as fast as you can. And sometimes that ends in injury. Um, the fact that it might lead to him starting more games is secondary to, to the fact that, that he was just playing good baseball. And it came out last night about 10 o'clock that the Royals could breathe a sigh of relief, only inflammation. Uh, Ned Yost, the manager for Kansas City, says he's going to be okay, we think. He'll be all right. They checked him out yesterday. Uh, the Royals pitch catching coach, Pedro Griffal, was on the phone most of the night, and so was Nick Kenny, the Royals head trainer, talking to the Venezuela GM, talking to the trainers, and talking to Salvi himself. He feels much better, Ned Yost added. So it, it's a good sign. I mean, of all things, we talked about how much we enjoy, uh, you know, could the WBC be kind of a lead-in to the Olympics? Had there been something like this that had taken Salvador Perez, one of the, the perennial all-stars in the game, out because you're playing in some fun tournament for national pride that has not the Olympics, it's just for, you know, it's, it's for the enjoyment of the game, I, I definitely think it would have hurt the, the possibility of baseball in the Olympics. It would have hurt the WBC further, obviously, this is part of the reason why home plate collisions have been removed from the game. That's a discussion for another time because trying to have uh, umpires, you know, deal with the the baseline infraction, all that's a pain in a pain in the butt, and, and it's all kinds of screwy. But I am glad to say at least that Salvador Perez is going to be okay. Now, 
we mentioned this, and I, I'm going to go with this because, again, if you've been watching the WBC, MLB Network is, is showing a ton of it. Uh, it's actually right down the road from me right now in Miami is where Pool C is, which is, I think, the best pool that there is right now in the WBC. And it was the heartbreaker last night. The USA against the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic is obviously the, uh, is the defending champions in the WBC. They come in, and the U.S. is actually up, what, 5-3 to three going into uh, the eighth inning. And you have a guy in Andrew Miller who was lights out last year, obviously isn't going to be used the way that he was in the postseason in the WBC. But there are, I mean, there's a huge pool of pitchers because there's a pitching restriction in each, uh, in, each, in each round. 65 pitches in the first round. I think it's 85, then goes to 90 for the championship round. So he's in there. He's got runners on, or two runners on, and Nelson Cruz up at the plate, and he hangs a slider, doesn't, you know, probably inner, inner quarter, inner third of the plate, where Nelson Cruz can go down, put the barrel on it, a slider coming left to right when the hitter has the advantage, and you make a mistake with that, it's going to end up in a very bad spot. And that bad spot was in the seats out in left field, and it put the, uh, Dominican, the Dominican Republic up 6-5, uh, to five, which was followed up two batters later by Starling Marte mashing a solo shot to right field. And then you know, a two-run lead for the U.S. ended up being a two-run deficit and a loss to end a very heartbreaking game in Miami. Yeah, and what really is, is upsetting about it is when you see a guy like uh, Andrew Miller, who had such a good year last year as a closer, you don't expect him to come in and make those mistakes, especially not to guys like, like Marte, uh, excuse me, uh, like Nelson Cruz and Sterling Marte, who he knows that if he makes a mistake to those guys, those guys are going to take him deep. It's going to happen. So to see him come in and make that mistake and, and end up with the U.S. getting, getting the L is, is upsetting. But I think we all knew that the United States and the Dominican Republic are like the all-star teams in this, in this World Baseball Classic. Japan's up there. Um, Puerto Rico's up there. But those two teams are probably going to be, well, and now I would say probably the Dominican Republic are going to be representative of the winning team of this World Baseball Classic. Uh, well, the Dominican Republic did beat Colombia in 11 innings today. Uh, and this is obviously March 12th uh, at the time of, of us doing the show. So they topped Colombia, which was a great game, by the way. Colombia has kind of been the sleeper and came back. So the, the Dominican Republic goes 3-0 and in pool play. They're on to San Diego. And right now the U.S. is 1-1. and They are facing Canada, who is 0-2. The U.S. needs to beat Canada. If they do, the U.S. will also go on to San Diego from Pool C. So it's obviously still there. Uh, I mean, when it comes down to it, th- these are going to be the two teams that are, I mean, they're all-star teams. And I think the only thing that could be, uh, you know, a little bit better, and it was something that, that uh, J.P. Morosi from NLB Network mentioned today, and I, I laughed at how awesome it would be, but imagine having, during the all-star game, the Dominican Republic team, uh, you know, play against the Major League Baseball All-Star team, one game just for, I mean, obviously no one's going to want to add another game into an already 162-game extended long season, but just how great that would be. I mean, that's almost what you're getting now. So the WBC is a blast, and there are some odd things about it. With In the 11th inning, you start with runners on first and second, um, which I believe it was Japan today and the Netherlands, and... Like we said, you, Japan bunted the runner over, had a two-run uh, two single, two-RBI single. That put him up. The ne- ne- Netherlands went ahead and uh, tried. They had Jerks and Profar, I believe, uh, up. They tried to let him uh, take a hack and ended up being an infield fly, a ground ball, and then a, you know, and then a, a fly out, and that was it, and they lost. So we've already, we are seeing how these odd extra inning rules can be applied, how – strange that it can be, 
Uh, and that's not something that we're going to get into, but you know, it, it's it's interesting to see. It definitely does get the game over faster, but it, it's kind of a kind of takes the wind out of your sails. It really changes the dynamic of the game. It was the first time I've actually seen that happen in professional baseball, and it, it certainly made it different for me. Yeah, I we've discussed this on the show. I'm not a fan of the entire thing. I get it. They're going to do it in rookie ball when games don't really matter. Um, obviously it matters to the people playing the games, but it doesn't really matter as far as the 162 game season in major league baseball, uh, that matters for championships and whatnot. So if they want to do it in rookie ball and they want to get those games over and get those guys off the field so they can rest and be ready to play again the next day, that's one thing. Please, please, Mr. Manford, do not bring this, this to my, uh, my beloved major league baseball. Another guy. Go ahead. Yeah, I will say, you were kind of transitioning the same way I, I was thinking. Is I thought this is kind of turning into the World Series show. We're talking about World Series champion to start the show, a World Series winning catcher the year before, and now a second baseman on the team that lost the World Series last year, Jason Kipnis. And unfortunately, we're talking about two of these three guys with injury reports. Right, exactly. And so – that brings us into Jason Kipnis, who's going to miss opening day for the Cleveland Indians, which is going to hurt them, uh, especially if this gets any worse. He has a strained rotator cuff on his right arm, which happens for a pitcher, man. I mean, you know, that's, again, we talk about that pitching motion not being a natural thing. And the, when you do it repeatedly, those, those, uh, second baseman. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Uh, it, I'm on the wrong. <laughs> guys, I, I, I want to go I'm ahead on the wrong and page throw the yeah. out there. Let me go ahead and throw this out there, kind of a, a public service announcement. Uh, Chris, as, you, as we've discussed, is in school, and he is in the middle of um, what I can only describe what he has told me as um, a, an absolutely hellacious week of spring break with midterms. Um, and the amount of things that he has to do has actually made me run face first into a wall for him. So he wouldn't concuss himself during his midterm week. So uh, if he does have a, a brain fart, although I know normally this is just him, we're going to go ahead and give him the benefit of the doubt that it's all midterms. So bear with him. A little bit of love. We're just trying to look out for uh, for my boy here. I apologize. I was on the Jake Arrieta page, and I'm looking at pitching stats. And yeah. Anyway. <laughs> we'll get to that in just a second. Jason Kipnis is going to miss opening day with a, with a strained right rotator cuff. Again, this is still this, the same idea. Idea still stands. Throwing a baseball is not a natural motion, and um, when you're a second baseman and you're doing all kind of crazy things over at second base, coming across the base, sweeping sidearm to get that double play down to thrown down to first, it's easy to strain those ligaments and those muscles in that arm. Um, but it's going to hurt him. It's going to hurt them. Uh, we're talking about a guy who had 23 home runs, hit 275 last year. And he's a guy on that team who is not only uh, one of the big bats, but he's also one of the leaders on that team. And uh, not having him on opening day doesn't sound like a big deal. There's just 161 more games to play. But as we saw and as we see every year at the end of the season, uh, 162 games to play is a misnomer. It, all comes, it, it can all come down to a single win or a single loss, and oftentimes does. We get playoff games. We get those amazing single game playoffs for the wild card. So I understand that, oh, it's just opening day. He'll be fine. He's going to play 161 other games. But don't let that get into your head because this could be a big deal for the Cleveland Indians. It definitely could. And I don't think it's going to be. I mean, everything that I, that I have seen that Tito Francona, the manager, of the Indians has said is this is pretty much just going to be um, precautionary. You know, he, you know, he, he's mainly been DHing. What he had said before is that throwing the ball and not swinging the bat is what was causing him discomfort. But what you don't want to do is be changing the mechanics of how you swing, which could then hurt something else. A la what we saw with Matt Harvey last year, begins changing maybe how we throw him because of the shoulder issue and got that. Um, got the issue with the, 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 nerve, the nerve issue. Um, so 
the thoracic outlet syndrome. So, you know, nothing has gone haywire according uh, to T- uh, Terry Francona, but it's being more care- like you said, it's a long season. It's a grind. And if you have one small thing wrong, that can snowball quickly into a lot of things or into a lot of time being missed. I would much rather see him be out early in the year. Yeah, maybe it takes him a week or two to get back and an extra week or two to get comfortable. But, you know, if he's been swinging the stick well, if he's comfortable in what he's doing, you've got, I mean, you're going to have a lot of positive energy in the clubhouse rolling over from last year. You got to get the the game seven loss out of your head. You got to look at what you put the Cubs through. You had them on the wall, and sometimes things just happen. But it's going to be one of those things where I I, I don't have a concern because Kipnis Lindor is going to be there. We said they're one of the best uh, infield duos in the game today. He'll be back. He'll be healthy, and the Indians are still going to be a contender and a, and a team to beat in the American League Central. Yeah, and. I think one of the things we got to remember is that the Cleveland Indians at the end of the day are probably going to be all right because they're, they're probably going to be end up being one of the stronger teams in that, in that division. Now they're going to have some, they're going to have some trouble with, with a couple of teams who have made some, some off off season moves. But in my opinion, I know we differ on this. In my opinion, they're going to come out on top of that division this year. Um, I think that they were well, probably I, bolstered, bolstered I still by. Think they can. I, I, I think that they're. I, I, I still think that that the the Royals maybe um, with getting Mustakas back and obviously Perez had to stay healthy and the Tigers had a great year last year. I think there's still a possibility um, that they could be challenged, but I, I'm certainly not in any way discounting the fact that the Indians have a uh, have a great chance at at repeating as division champs and, and, and making a, a extended run into late October. Right. So that's kind of our injury report. Um, I know it sounds like not very many guys, but these are big name guys that are important to the teams that they play for. And any injury in, to guys like this is a big deal for those teams. Um, at least we still have only had one stupid injury uh, as far as this season goes, and that is still Brian you just Flynn. He just couldn't hold off it, could you? I couldn't. You just I couldn't, couldn't hold off it, man. <laughs> That's Brian Flynn, the Royals receiver, who fell through the roof of his barn and knocked himself out, who now they're saying after an eight-week recovery period may not be able to get his start his relieving job back with the Kansas City Royals. He broke a rib and had three non-displaced fractures in his vertebrae. So he's injured pretty badly doing something that he definitely has the money to pay someone else to do. So speaking of ribs, uh, this is something that you and I have talked about at length, both on and off the show. And Jake Arrieta, who is, of course, a... He, by the way, for, he, he's the pitch. He, he's the pitcher. Kid, yeah, this is second baseman. Arietta is the pitcher. Just thanks. I, I I'm right. struggling with my midterms, but I'm 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 not struggling so badly that I don't remember that Jake Arietta is a pitcher. Um, second. Arietta says, if a young player flips his bat after a home run, he might quote, wear the next one in the ribs. So this is something that we've talked about at length on this show about um, when is it okay? When is it not okay? Is it ever okay to flip the bat? Do you, is it something you have to earn? Is it something that comes with veteran status is getting dinged for it? Something you should expect is getting dinged for it. Something that pitchers need to move away from. We've had all of these conversations, but for, for a top tier pitcher, an ACE type pitcher to come out in Jake Arrieta and say that, yeah, absolutely. If he's a vet, he's earned it, no problem. If he's a young guy, he might wear one in the ribs. And, what do you and think? And I actually had that. I, well, I had that that, that whole quote, and it, when I when I read it, it, the reason I wanted to I sent it to you is because I, I know you've always said that you were a you were a bat flipper, but you were a watcher. Sometimes a watcher a, is is is. is worse. I was a watcher. Yeah. But he said, I, "quote I didn't flip the bat often, but I watched I watched balls leave the park." Every time I hit one. Arietta said, quote, if it's a young guy, he 
He might not have earned that right yet. Somebody might wear the next one in the ribs. But if it's a guy like Bautista, then you've got to tip your cap. Certain guys have earned the right to do that, end quote. Um, now, I had a chance, obviously, uh, this is back with, with, during the golf tournament, and, uh, and it was great talking to all those guys, but Phil Nevin was there, a, a, a much, uh, you know, an old-school player, um, a guy who, you know, hard-nosed. And, you know, I was kind of curious what his thoughts were on this. You know, if, if obviously not a pitcher, but a guy who, you know, played the game in the old school way. And, and I asked him, you know, is there a sudden entitlement in the game? We've seen guys like Bryce Harper, who I mentioned. Obviously, we had the Bautista bat flip. We had the Machado and the, the Ventura issue last year. So take a listen to what Phil Nevin has to say on this topic. Well, I think there can be little doubt that Phil Nevin kind of hits the nail on the head with that one. Um, and, you know, like he said, you don't know if he, – he can't really say if it's good for baseball, it's bad for baseball, it's just where baseball is headed probably. But one of the things that he says really sticks to me, and that is that kids are emulating these guys, right? And this is something that Jake Arrieta said too. The kids are emulating these guys flipping the bat. And when you're in Little League – right? And, or you're in Babe Ruth baseball or, or, or whatever the leagues are called where you live and you hit a home run, which is not something that happens on a regular basis. Bautista hits 20 something home runs a year. Kids in Babe Ruth hit three. So when you're a kid in Babe Ruth and you hit a home run and you watch it leave the park and then you flip the bat like Jose Bautista, you realize watching something like that, that that really isn't adding to the confidence of the guy who hit the home run. It's really detracting from the confidence of the guy who gave it up. It's hurting that guy. Now, a guy in the major league, in the major leagues, a pitcher in the major leagues, he doesn't have to worry about his confidence being detracted from. He's at the top of the game. But a kid in Little League doesn't need to stand there and watch you gloat at him after hitting a home run. I know I'm guilty of it. I've done it in the past, not in, not in Little League, but I did it when I played high school ball. I did a little bit in my stint in college ball, but I hit more home runs than, than, than the average guy in those, both of those leagues. So I probably hurt a lot of feelings. And you know what? I did wear a few balls in the ribs. Um, it happens. Guys get hit for it. I got hit for it. Uh, I don't necessarily condone that action because your finger slips a little bit. Next thing you know, you're hitting a guy in the chin. Next thing you know, you're hitting a guy in the cheekbone. You're breaking an orbital bone. Anything can happen when you intentionally throw at a guy. If, if we can watch major league pitchers who are the top pitchers in the game overthrow an intentional walk, then it's not too far-fetched to say that an intentional uh, hit by pitch could go horribly wrong and severely injure someone, especially if you're throwing at a guy and you're throwing 85, 95 miles an hour. I mean, you could really hurt somebody. So then my question to you, and obviously I get, I get this more to you as, as being a, a former player, but at what point do you kind of stop being a young guy? You, you know, and everyone says, oh, well, you know, there's age involved. But, I, I mean, age isn't going to be as much of a factor. But, you know, let's say that you're a guy who's been stuck in the minors for five or six years and you're 27, 28, and you get one and you watch it. Well, are you still a young guy because you haven't been in the big leagues long enough? We have guys like Mike Trout, who's 25, Carlos Correa is 22, Manny Machado and Gary Sanchez are 24. So what's the difference here that Trout's been in the big leagues for four or five years and Correa's been in for two and Machado's been in for a while and Gary Sanchez came up last year and had his big year is probably, at least right now, from what he did in the last season, the rookie of the year uh, leader in the, uh, you know, for candidacy coming in 2017. I mean, at, at what point... Do you do you decide that you're no longer a young guy? The problem is that unwritten rule, which we all talk about, and we understand that they're there, but not everybody has the same sense of unwritten rule morality from one guy to the next. John Lester might be different than Jake Arrieta, might be different than Madison Bumgarner, than Clayton Kershaw, than Julio Tehran. You know, if you're a young pitcher, 
can you hit a young hitter for watching a ball that you give up when you're the young guy? Like, you know, I mean, at, at what a veteran point hitter. do these lines that are so blurry? Exactly. Veteran hitters, you know, and that's almost worse because the veteran guy is showing you up. So at that point, okay, if, if, if I come in as a rookie and I serve one up to Jose Bautista, and he flips the bat, then is one of my relievers who's a veteran going to throw one and hit, you know, and hit him in the ribs for being you know, a jackhole and showing up the young guy who just came to the show and, hey, you know what, he's, you know, he's just got here, Give, cut him some slack. Like, at what point do you let it go? And that's the issue that I have is, is there's no so, real continuity between guys. And, and so as a player, how would you police that? So, well, that's the thing. I don't think you can police it. But here's how I look at it as, as a ball player. What you got to do and what's important is you have to take your time and you have to look at where the guy's been, what he's done, and what he's accomplished. Okay. Manny Machado, he's been up in the bigs for a while. There's no doubt that he's a veteran major league player. Mike Trout, there's no doubt that he's a veteran major league player. However, Mike Trout is about ex- as exciting as watching the grass grow. I mean, it, I, I get it. It's, it's really exciting to watch him hit home runs. It's really exciting to watch him do well, but his, he lacks personality. Yeah, he, he, Manny Machado he, he's, a hot, has, he's a hot shot robbing a homer. He's not a hot shot hitting a homer, which, right. which is so, so far different than most guys. Right. But Manny Machado is the, is the exact opposite. Manny Machado has no, no deficit of personality, and guys don't like it. Guys don't like it. He's got a bad attitude sometimes. He likes to rush pitchers when he gets hit. He likes to run them, rush the man. He likes to start the fight. He likes to jack his jaw. But we're also talking about a guy who can throw out somebody from the coach's box in midair on, down that third baseline. He's got a strong arm. He's definitely and a better time ball player. Is, half the time is a laser. It's not even a freaking one hopper. Right. right. Half the time it's a laser. He's probably throwing, you know, 140, 150 feet. And you look at a guy like that, yeah, he's got an attitude. Yeah, guys don't like him. But him and, him and Mike Trout are on about equal footing as far as being a veteran in, in Major League Baseball goes. Now, I still think that if both of those guys, if they were playing each other and Mike Trout watched a home run and flipped his bat, and then Manny Machado flipped, watched a home run and flipped his bat. Manny Machado is the guy who's going to take it in the ribs. Why? Because Mike Trout is the household type name, right? He's the face of baseball type player. And Manny Machado is the loud mouth sort of jackhole that you see getting hit. Um, along the same lines, I don't see... So how about Bryce Harper? So let's go Bryce Harper, because I think Bryce Harper is, is, is the guy who's fiery... On all kinds. We've seen him come out and, you know, and, and flip off and curse at an umpire in Brian Knight last year after he'd gotten tossed, came back on the field. You know, we've seen how many ejections where, you know, and, and granted, he may have one of the best eyes in baseball. And that's great. But, but end of the day, his actions affect the team on a much grander scale than just him getting hit. He gets himself run from games because he doesn't know how to bite his tongue. So at what point on a guy like that who has – you know, won an MVP, is probably the face of baseball on the East Coast, one of the young faces of baseball as a whole. Where do you go with a guy like that? Because that's where a lot of this comes from is, you know, you know the, the, he flips the hair. and he, he, I mean, he, he's a fiery, a fiery guy. But, I mean, and maybe at the, at the end of the day, this is guys are trying to go against the grain of what baseball used to be and add some flair into it. And, well, you know, Always guys are going to be resistant to it, but is it time to go ahead and loosen up? See, no, I don't think it is. I don't think that bat flipping should be a thing that, that permeates baseball. I don't think that that sort of flair should be a thing that permeates baseball, and here's why. There's this certain idea of act like you've been there before. It's not the first home run you've ever hit. It's not even the first home run you've ever hit in an important situation. So act like you've been there before. Right. And to that same to that same idea, this is what happened in football, in my opinion. Right. Now, 
every single play in football is celebrated like it's the most amazing thing that's ever been done. A guy tackles a guy at the goal line or a guy tackles a guy at the line of scrimmage and doesn't allow him to, to, to gain any yards, and he celebrates with the, the flexing and the Hulk muscles. And listen, guy, especially, your especially job. when you're down by three scores. Yeah. When you're down that's by your 21 job. points. Which, okay? Right. Your job is to stop that guy from getting yards. Stop celebrating. Act like you've been there. You have 15 tackles a game. You don't have to celebrate every single one of them. And I'm really afraid that if we step back on this idea of bat flipping and flair, that that's going to permeate baseball. And now you're going to guys have guys making routine catches out in the outfield and then celebrating them like they just won the World Series. They start bouncing up and down and hollering and screaming. Save that for the postseason. When it's the end of the year and you win something that actually means something, then celebrate. I can I can understand that. I mean, I, I certainly – I don't quite think that you – I disagree with you in the sense that it's like football. I don't think so because – No, no, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not saying getting, it's like football. I'm saying it's a slippery slope to what's going on in football now. If you, I don't if think you normalize it, it I, it's but, a slippery slope. But I don't think it. I mean, but to me, in baseball, and again, this is coming from a guy who, who who played two years in Little League, and we lost every game we ever played. I mean, I, I look at the game more, you know, obviously now from an umpire's perspective, and I can see it more, you know, a, a, from an analyst perspective because of how much I, I watch the game, you know, from 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 an umpire's point of view. But to me, you're not really normalizing anything. Guys aren't getting all, you know, all, all, all crazy uh, when they make a, a a big jump throw. You know the the, the most energetic fielder we saw was Ozzy Smith, and that was because the Wizard came out and he'd do flips, you know, when he came out to take the field. Once a game, it was kind of just it was just kind of his shtick, and that was fine. It was funny. Everyone liked it. But you know, you aren't even seeing guys who bat flip on every home run, but on those no doubters, you know, like what we saw last night, where Nelson Cruz jacks and he turns around and he's running backwards, just giddy. Looking at his team because because he just you know he just did that for his country for his team you know the the opening uh, at bat today between the Dominican Republic and Colombia was Gene Segura and he kind of gave like a, like a little bit of a hop step uh, when he singled into uh, I think in the center field off of an 0-2 count to lead off the game you know, you're not seeing guys do stuff like that all the time but you know if if, if you jack one I don't have an issue same reason why. You know, guys get excited. They throw the helmet on a walk-off. I mean, at that end of the day, okay, it's one victory out of 162 games. Why is it that big of a deal? You, you don't get that crazy if you win on a, a normal, okay, third out, good job, here we go. I get it. I get it. But, again, the World Baseball Classic is a no-tomorrow type of tournament, right? These are guys who are playing the only international form of baseball they can play since they can't play in the Olympics. So now they're playing international baseball, representing their countries in a winner-go-home style tournament. And winning those games is important because you don't get to try again. You don't get 162 games. You don't get 162 games plus three series of playoffs. You get one series. You get one But a hop step on a leadoff single? A hop step on a leadoff single to start the game. The first inning, top of the first. Again. Like I said, if you normalize the bat flipping, those are the things that are going to come along. It's the slippery slope mentality, right? I realize that slippery slope is a logical fallacy. However, it's not, that, it's not like this isn't a possibility. When you see young kids, when you see young kids watching players do things like that, like hop step on a leadoff single to start the game, and then they start emulating that. Now, when these generations come up, they're going to think not only are they already entitled, not only have they already been getting, spent their entire Little League careers getting trophies for not, not, not showing up. Oh, right? Lord, here we go. The participation now, we're now into the participation trophy argument. But when you, when you have these kids that, that see this sort of reckless celebration unnecessary celebration like the hop step to lead the game off, then they normalize that. 
and their generation is going to continue that, that trend. And as that trend continues, it's going to get more and more permea- permeated. So, no, I don't think Major League Baseball needs to stop making bat flipping and celebrating ridiculously like that against the grain. I think they need to maintain that identity, maintain the fact that that, that, that goes against what's acceptable, especially for guys who just come up, and they need to normalize this idea that, hey, act like you've been here before, be a professional, play baseball. I understand what you're saying, um, and, and, and you know, we'll close on that. I certainly get where you are coming from. My only, I guess my, my biggest um, kind of issue there ends up being, that I think the hop step and things, it's excitement because you're in a tournament like this, and I don't think it's going to permeate into everything. I think that will be something that gets policed. I think guys understand what, um, what a big moment is compared to just regular, regular stuff. That's why I say, you know, on a walk-off that throwing the helmet and being all excited is a lot different, you know, ripping a guy's jersey off because you, you walked off when maybe that's game, you know, game 46 out of 162, you know, big whoop. Right. And like I said, it's not going to be this generation of ball players that does it. It's not going to be this generation of ball players that it leads to that happening. Just like it wasn't the football players in the 1980s that, that celebrated on every, on every play. It was the football players in the 1990s, guys like Deion Sanders, who did celebrate on every play. It didn't permeate football then. However, the young kids coming into the league who watched that growing up are now the guys who normalize and permeate that action. And that's the same kind of slippery slope you're going to see in baseball. It's not the guys in this generation. It's the guys in future generations who are sitting at home, 8, 9, 10 years old, watching them play, act like that on national television, watching replays of that on YouTube. Those are the guys that are going to normalize that sort of behavior. It's certainly a fair point, uh, not, not one that I can you know, deeply disagree with you on. Um, I, 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 I don't believe that it will, will be the same way that it is, um, but I also – agree with what Kevin Millar said a couple months ago is that, you know, he, he doesn't, guys are never going to go ahead and just allow it to happen. It's not going to be one of those things where it just becomes understood and it's okay. To me, there's a part of it where, yes, you're showing guys up and it's a way of, I think it's the way guys look and if they're staring at a pitcher, if they're saying something, you know, if you jack one and you kind of just watch it, like, my gosh, that thing has hit a long way. Okay, we all appreciate the long ball. But how do you handle the rest of it coming at guys, saying things, and beyond? And that's where I think the, sip, the slippery slope you mentioned comes in more is, you know, can guys, can guys check certain things at the door, or is there always going to be a little bit more to it? And I think that's where the issue becomes is there's always probably going to be more to it. So, Man, a, another full show, guys. Again, thanks for sticking with us. It's been uh, jam-packed. Hopefully next week, not going to be the injury stuff. We'll have some more of the WBC, and Chris won't have midterms, hopefully, next week. I, I just want to say one last thing, and I don't want to get into a big, long conversation about this. Um, at least we're not Tim Tebow. At least we didn't get stalked at Mets camp and have to have a woman arrested for claiming to be in a matrimonial relationship with Tim Tebow and stalking him and entering uh, restricted access areas to be near him. So at least we have that going for us, which is nice. But I, 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 am, I am sure that he has forgiven her for that. And uh, all will be well in the world. So guys, it's been another good episode out of left field here. Graham and Chris with you. Absolutely love doing this. Love that you guys are here. We are just around the corner. From, from spring training being done, the ball getting put in play on the start of the 2017 season, April 2nd on a Sunday. It begins my nephew's birthday, which is doubly special for me. And uh, Chris is excited because he has tickets now, uh, half season tickets, I believe, to go see the Diamondbacks. So he gets to do things that make me very, very angry because I don't get that kind of love. But, hey, we will see like, what happens. I'll be a- I'll be at the Giants-Diamondbacks on opening day. 
Matter yeah, of fact, no I'm probably going to watch. I'm, I'm probably going to watch that entire opening series. Yeah, I, I don't believe we asked that question, Chris, but but thank you for that <laughs> show off. Uh, <laughs> guys, again, thanks for joining. For Chris, I'm Graham. It's been out of left field. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you guys next.